Good afternoon, students. In last class, we discussed about what is DNA, why we look like our parents, why there is some similarity between the siblings, and I told you that DNA is the genetic material which is responsible for this feature. In all the organisms on Earth, except few viruses, which are called as retroviruses, DNA is a genetic material. Now, when we are talking about DNA and there are such vital molecules of identity, it's, it becomes very necessary for us to understand what is the basic structure of this biomolecule. First of all, what is DNA? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It looks like this. It is double stranded structure and it is a polymer of small monomers which are called as nucleotides. And these nucleotides are attached to each other through phosphodiester bond. Now these are very bulky words, they seem to be very complicated, but it's very, very easy. Just like as beads form a bracelet together, similarly these are the small monomers which are together, strung together to form DNA-like structure. But here there are two strands, that is, it is double strung. And the best part about this structure is that the distance between these two strands is always same. That makes it parallel. So, going into the detail of the structure of DNA, we will be going into detail of the structure of DNA one by one. Let's first study the structure of its monomer, which is called as nucleotide. As you can see, that nucleotide is basically having three major components. This particular monomer is having three major components. One is deoxyribose sugar. Deoxyribose is a sugar which is present in the structure of nucleotide. This whole is a nucleotide. This is the sugar. Then the second component which is called base. The bases are of four different types in DNAs. Basically, they are divided into purines and pyridines. And the third one is a phosphate. You know, the DNA has a negative charge. Why it has a negative charge? Because it is con a negative charge is conferred to it because of its phosphate group. So if you start moving DNA on a gel in presence of an electric field, it will always move towards the positive electrode that is out. So the DNA is always negatively charged and it is basically a polymer of monomers which is called as nucleotide and nucleotide is having three major components, the deoxyribose, the base and the phosphate. I told you that the bases are of two major types, the pyrimidines and purines. Pyrimidines are made up of one six member ring and there are basically two types of pyrimidines that is thymine and cytosine. However, purines are made up of a six member ring fused to a five member ring. It looks like this. So, it is also having two components, the adenine and the guanine. The rings are not only made up of carbon, but they have specific formulae. The structure is different. Now, the purines always base pair with the pyrimidine and pyrimidine always base pair with the purines. In DNA, we are having just two types of pyrimidines, that is thymine and cytosine. However, if it is RNA structure, there is going to be uracil instead of thymine. So it is having two pyrimidines. The RNA also has two pyrimidines, that is uracil and cytosine, whereas DNA is having only thymine and cytosine. That is a basic difference in the base composition of DNA and RNA. The rest remains the same. 
So you are all aware of the general structure of a nucleotide in very generalized form if I say that this is a nucleotide, a monomer which, is, which I am reflecting like this here, it is made up of three components, the phosphate, the deoxy ribose and the base which can be either a purine or a pyrimidine. If it is a purine, it has to be guanine and adenine and if it is pyrimidine, it has to be cytosine or thymine if it is DNA and uracil or cytosine if it is RNA. On this image, I have shown you that the two nucleotides are linked together through a covalent bond which is called as a phosphodiester bond. So, there is a bond which is formed between the 5' phosphate and 3', 1, 2, 3. Third part of this deoxyribose has a hydroxyl group and it forms a bond with the 5' phosphate of the subsequent nucleotide. This is a covalent bond and this bond is called as phosphodiester bond and this happens repeatedly. The 3' hydroxyl of this deoxyribose is going to form the phosphodiester bond with the subsequent nucleotide phosphate. This is how the chain continues. Now since, for example, this is, a, this is repeated, since this end of the DNA is having phosphate linked to the fifth carbon of deoxyribose and this phosphate is not bonded to any other deoxyribose it has 5 prime it is called as 5 prime however if you see at the last nucleotide its ribose hydroxyl is, will not be bonded to any subsequent phosphate so its 3 prime hydroxyl would be free so this end would be called as 3 prime so always the terminals of the DNA are, are labeled as 5 prime or 3 prime depending upon whether it is having 5 prime phosphate free or 3 prime hydroxyl of the deoxyribose as free. Now certain principles regarding the structure of DNA. Now DNA is made up of two strands of nucleotides that are joined together by hydrogen bonding. Now here if you see that there are two strands of DNA. The nucleotides which are present here are going to pair with the nucleotides which are present on the other strand. And these two nucleotides are going to be held together by hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonding occurs between the complementary base pairs. If there is going to be, for example, In this strand, there has to be thymine on this strand because adenine is always going to base pair with thymine. Adenine is a purine, thymine is a pyrimidine, and they both complement each other and they form double hydrogen bond. If there is going to be a guanine residue on this strand, there will be a cytosine residue on this strand and these are going to be held together by three hydrogen bonds. So always a purine base pairs with a pyrimidine and vice versa. Adenine always base pairs with thymine with the help of two hydrogen bonds and guanine always base pairs with cytosine with the help of three hydrogen bonds. Okay? Each pair is connected to hydrogen bonding and hydrogen bonding always occurs which should be one pyrimidine and one purine. So we have discussed about two types of bonds, phosphodiester bond and hydrogen bond. Phosphodiester bond is the bond which is present between the two nucleotides of the same strand, it is a covalent bond. However, hydrogen bond is formed between the two complementary bases of the two strands. Clear? Now if you can see, this is the structure of cytosine and this is the structure of bonding. I told you that guanine is having a six membered ring followed by a five membered ring. And cytosine is a pyrimidine, and cytosine will always base pair with guanine. And you can see that there are three hydrogen bonds, these green beads, beaded bonds. It is having three hydrogen bonds. So if guanine is present on one strand of the DNA, it has to be cytosine which is going to be present on the 
second strand or the complementary strand of the DNA. They always follow this principle. It's never that the guanine is going to be a pair with adenine or thymine. Guanine and cytosine always complement each other. Same is the story with the thymine and adenine. Thymine always base pairs with adenine and adenine always base pairs with thymine in DNA. However, if it is a structure of RNA, thymine is not present and it's uracil. Now, you can see that the adenine and thymine are hydrogen bonded but the number of hydrogen bonds unlike here is 2. However, there were 3 hydrogen bonds here but here you can see that there were only 2 hydrogen bonds. To give you a feel of how the chemical composition of these rings go, always there is a hydrogen bonding between hydrogen and electronegative elements. Fluorine, nitrogen and oxygen can form hydrogen bonds with hydrogen. So here there is one hydrogen bond between oxygen and hydrogen, the another hydrogen bond between hydrogen and nitrogen, the third hydrogen bond between the hydrogen and oxygen of cytosine and guanine. Similar principle use is used here and there is two hydrogen bonding, one between hydrogen and oxygen and another between nitrogen and hydrogen of adenine and thymine. These are not covalent bonds, remember children, these are hydrogen bonds. Now, this is an extended image of DNA. Now, this is one strand of DNA and this is second strand of DNA. You can see that the distance between these two strands is constant. That is why we call that the two strands are anti-parallel. Now, why anti before parallel. Parallel means two lines which are having same distance between them throughout. Fine. It is having same distance. Then why the word anti has been used? The word anti has been used because you can see that in this particular strap, the this is the first base. This is the ribose sugar and this is the phosphate. This is the first nucleotide of this strand. Right? The first nucleotide of this strand, its phosphate is linked to the fifth carbon of this deoxyribose sugar, which is free and is not engaged in forming any phosphodiester bond. However, you can see that this is the second nucleotide. It is having a base, deoxyribose, and to the fifth carbon of this deoxyribose, the phosphate which was attached, is involved in forming this phosphodiester bond after dehydration and removing of a water molecule with the three prime hydrogen, hydroxyl group, which is present right here. This has to be repeated. Whereas in the second nucleotide, you can see that this is the base, this is the sugar and this is the 5' phosphate. The 5' phosphate of the second nucleotide is involved in forming the phosphodiester bond, which is formed between the hydroxyl group of the 3' carbon of deoxyribose and 5' phosphate, so it is the phosphodiester bond. Again, the 3' hydroxyl here is forming phosphodiester bond with the phosphate of the subsequent nucleotide. Its hydroxyl, 3' hydroxyl is forming phosphodiester bond of the phosphate of the subsequent nucleotide. But the la last nucleotide, hydroxyl, is not involved in formation of any phosphodiester bond. So, the 3' hydroxyl is free here. So, the 5' phosphate is free in the first nucleotide and 3' hydroxyl is free in the last nucleotide. And that is why the strand of DNA, its terminals are named that way. If the 5' phosphate is free, that end is called as 5' phosphate. If 3' end is free, it is called as 3' phosphate. However, if you see the other strand, its last nucleotide is having 5' five five, five phosphate free. And its first nucleotide 
is having 3 prime hydroxyl free. So it's having, it's, this is a 3 prime terminal of this strand and 5 prime terminal of this strand. So if you look, if you compare both the strands, always in front of the 5 prime strand of one strand, there is going to be 3 prime end of the other strand. It is never going to be 5 prime towards 5 prime or 3 prime towards 3 prime. It is always going to be 5 prime facing 3 prime and 3 prime end facing 5 prime. That is why since they are opposite, it is called as anti. And since the distance between both of them is same, it is called as parallel. So together the DNA is called as anti -parent. Now you can all see that this is the phosphodiester band. A proper covalent bond which is holding these nucleotides together in this strand of DNA. However, these two strands are not held together by any covalent bond. There is hydrogen bond between the complementary bases. You can see that there are two hydrogen bonds between the purines and pyrimidines here and three hydrogen bonds between the purines and pyrimidines here. So they, if there is two hydrogen bonds, what are they? Yes, they are adenine and thymine. And if there is three hydrogen bonds, what are they? They are of course guanine and cytosine. Very good. So the distance between these two strands is same, that is why parallel, since the terminals are facing. Now, this is a clearer picture showing or depicting the anti-parallel structure of DNA. Now, you all can see that one nucleotide has three components. The base, the deoxyribose and the phosphate. The hydroxyl present at the 3' carbon of deoxyribose forms phosphodiester bond with the phosphate of the subsequent nucleotide which is attached to the fifth carbon of the deoxyribose and together they form this phosphodiester bond which has been shown in red. Because the first phosphate was having free 5' phosphate it is called as 5' end and the last nucleotide is having free 3' hydroxyl which is called as 3' end. Same happens this side but in just opposite manner that is why DNA strands are called as anti -pattern. and both the strands are held together by hydrogen bonds, double hydrogen bonds if it is adenine and thymine pairing and triple hydrogen bond if it is guanine and cytosine pairing. Now children take out your notebooks we will be doing one assignment. Now if, you if I tell you the structure of DNA or the composition of DNA of one strand, can you depict the structure of another strand? Let's try. It. For example, I have written that the one strand is having composition A, T, T, G, C, A, G, and 3 prime. Now, do you understand the meaning of 3 prime and 3 prime and 5 prime? Now if I need to know the structure or the composition of the second strand which is also called as complementary strand, what you need to do in front of 5 prime, what is that? 3 prime. So you will write 3 prime. Adding always base pairs with thymine. Thymine will always base pair with adenine. Thymine will always, always again base pair with adenine. Guanine is going to base pair with cytosine, cytosine base pairs with guanine, adenine base pairs with thymine and guanine base pairs with cytosine. So this is the rule of complementarity. If you know the composition or sequence of bases of one strand, you can decode the sequence of another strand. But you should remember what are the terminals. If it is 5 prime here, it has to be 3 prime here. If it is 3 prime here, it has to be 5 prime here. Now, what are going to be the hydrogen bonds between them? There are going to be two hydrogen bonds. Here again two hydrogen bonds. Here again two hydrogen bonds. Between guanine and cytosine, there are three hydrogen bonds. 
Again, three hydrogen bonds, two hydrogen bonds, and three hydrogen bonds. So all of you are now aware about the basic structure of DNA. That DNA is a polymer of nucleotides. Nucleotide is basically made up of three components: the sugar, that is deoxyribose sugar, the phosphate, which confers negative charge to the DNA, and the base. Base could be of two types: purines and pyrimidines. Purines are of two types, guanine and adenine. And pyrimidines are of two types, cytosine and thymine in case of DNA and cytosine and uracil in case of RNA. And when they bond together, when these nucleotides bond together, they are held together by phosphodiester bonds which are called as, which are covalent bonds basically. And the second strand, it is same, the phosphodiester bond is holding together the monomers of DNA, that is the nucleotides are held together by this phosphodiester bond and both the strands have same distance throughout, that is why they are parallel, but their terminals are opposite, that is why they are anti-parallel and the distance between them is maintained throughout. This DNA is present as a genetic material in all of us, in our cells, in our nucleus. In the nucleus, this DNA is compact, very compactly packed in structures which we have already read in lower classes, that is called as chromosomes. So the amount of DNA which is present in our nucleus is very, very large. It is compacted in, the, in a form so that it acquires the shape of chromosomes. So how this DNA is packed? So DNA is packed like this. You can see the double stranded structure, the red structure, that is DNA. And it is packed around an octamer of positively charged proteins, which are called as histones. Now why positively charged proteins? Because the DNA is negative charge because of the phosphate group which is present in its nucleotides. Now it will be attracted only to the positively charged proteins only. So this is an octamer of histone proteins around which the DNA is wrapped. Eight histones form the core and the DNA is wrapped approximately twice around this core. So and this whole structure of octamer and DNA wrapped around it approximately twice is called as nucleosome. So nucleosome, one nucleosome is attached to another nucleosome through a continuous strand of DNA which is called as linker DNA. So this, can you tell me what is the number of chromosomes in bacteria? Yes. The bacteria really do not have any chromosome. The chromosome is essentially a feature of eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, the DNA is present in circular structure. Like this. It is not present in any nucleus, it is in the cytoplasm. So, for formation of chromosome, the DNA is wrapped around the nucleosome and there are other levels of compaction. Finally, from DNA, a chromosome is made. So, I have told you that DNA is negatively charged because of the phosphate group which is present in it. And the proteins, which is called as histone proteins, H3, H4, H1, these are different types of histone proteins which are present, they are positively charged. So DNA and the proteins are electromagnetically attracted to each other to form chromatin, a compact form of DNA. Now, we have read about DNA. But in the previous class, I told you that you are like your parents or you have similarity to your siblings because of genes. Then how is this gene related to DNA? We have studied the structure of DNA, but then where is the gene? 
Now, any stretch of being which holds for a functional product is called as G. That is, this sequence of DNA, if it is holding for something which can be an RNA or which can be a protein also, it is a gene. All the genes are first transcribed into RNA. This is called as central dogma. The DNA is trans Transcribed into RNA and RNA is translated into protein. So, any stretch of DNA which is coding for a functional product is called as a gene. Now, the question is that are all genes translated? No, not necessary. The genes for tRNA, the genes for ribosomal RNA, they are not translated. But their corresponding stretch on DNA is called a gene. So gene has to code for a functional product and the alternate forms of the genes are called as alleles. We have two copies of each type of chromosome in our body. That is, 50% of our DNA comes from our father, 50% of our DNA comes from our mother. Right? So for each and every gene, we are having two copies, which are two alternate forms of our gene. That is why we are, we are not alike our parents. We are not exact copy of our parents. We, have, we are similar to our parents. Because then there are different laws of Mendel's which come into play depending upon the dominance and recessiveness of a gene, the phenotype of the bearer is expressed. So, this is the central term. And from DNA, when one cell divides into two cells, the DNA also has to be doubled, so that each daughter cell gets equal amount of DNA. So, DNA is doubled and then it is divided into them. And that process is called as replication. So these are the three major pathways that is replication, transcription and translation through which the information is transferred from one generation to another generation for which we express our phenotype etc. So genes are the unit of genetic information. Now for example, Which is going to check 
whether the other gene should be expressed or not. There are certain factors, there are certain genes which are going to regulate the function of another gene. There are inducers, there are promoters, there are certain genes which are expressed all the time. They are called as housekeeping genes. However, there are certain genes which are expressed only when they are induced. They are called as they work on the principle of operons. We will be going into details of these in the subsequent chapters. So genes can also regulate how the other genes are expressed. Clear? All the cells of an organism contain the same genetic information but they do not allow all express the same genes. We all have 23 pair of chromosomes. We all have same number of genes for our complexion, same number of genes for our IQ level. Same number of genes for the color of our people. Same number of genes for the type of hair we are having. But then why they are different? Because the genetic information which we are getting from our parents is different. And on the basis of the relative relatedness of the genes. Which gene is dominant, which gene is recessive, etc. And this leads to cell differentiation. Cell differentiate by the genes that are activated. Here, 